Hey everyone, John Reed here from Learn to Stargaze and author of the new book 110 Things to See with a Telescope. In this video, we're going to learn how to use an equatorially mounted telescope for basic visual astronomy. After we show you how to use this equatorially mounted telescope, we'll go to a nearby field and let random people use it and see how they do. This is Learn to Stargaze. If you've just received a telescope that looks like this, you're probably wondering how to use it. And this video is for you. If you're wondering if you should buy a telescope that looks like this, consider this. If you ask a seasoned astronomer what type of telescope to buy, they'll probably recommend a Dobsonian. Why? Because Dobsonians are effortless to use, and you can easily see lots of cool stuff. There are many different models of Dobsonians at pretty much every price point. Not many seasoned astronomers would recommend a sub $200 equatorially mounted telescope like this to a beginner. And this is pretty much any telescope with EQ in the name. That said, because this telescope looks like how people believe a telescope should look, this telescope, along with the 127 millimeter Newtonian version, is extremely popular. And based on feedback I've gotten from viewers in countries outside the US and Canada, this might be the only model of telescope available to them. And just because seasoned astronomers don't recommend it, that doesn't mean if you have it, you can't enjoy it. There are lots of people that love their small telescopes on equatorial mounts. The reason this design exists at all is that it gives the observer the ability to track objects across the sky. But why does this even matter? Well, as the Earth turns on its axis, the entire sky appears to rotate. This means that unless a telescope is motorized, when you look through the eyepiece, you'll see the objects move across your field of view. Equatorial telescopes are designed so that after you found your target, you simply turn this knob, that's the right ascension knob, to offset the Earth's rotation, thus keeping your target within the field of view. I actually found this extremely helpful when doing a lunar observation program that required me to keep the moon in my field of view for long periods of time so that I could sketch what I was seeing. So if you're drawing or sketching things that you see in space, things that require you to stay on an object for a long period of time, and you want to do this without a computerized telescope, without a motorized mount, an equatorial telescope might be for you. Back before computerized telescopes, EQ scopes were also used to locate objects in the night sky. This was based on objects declination and right ascension. Those are coordinates equivalent to latitude and longitude. That's what these dials here on the telescope were used for. Although it's possible to locate objects using this method, it is very difficult, rarely done, and beyond the scope of this video. So I've assumed you follow the assembly instructions correctly and the telescope is ready to go. Let's quickly go over some of the parts of this telescope that are unique to those on an equatorial mount. First you have the altitude knobs. These allow the telescope to go up and down. Then you have an azimuth knob which, when loosened, allows the telescope to move left and right. Fancier telescopes have fine adjustment knobs for this axis as well. Note that these knobs are only used during the alignment process, not while observing or looking for targets. Next, we have the right ascension axis. This moves the telescope around the celestial poles, or if you're in the northern hemisphere, the north star. The lock for this axis is here. Generally, this axis is loose when looking for targets and locked while observing. Then we have the declination axis. This moves the telescope toward and away from the celestial pole, or if you're in the northern hemisphere, toward and away from the north star. This axis is loose while looking for targets and locked while observing. And these are the slow motion controls, one for declination and one for right ascension. These are generally used after you've found your target for centering and for fine adjustments. The right ascension control, or RA control, is used to keep the object you are observing within the field of view. Now it's time to start using the telescope. The first thing we're gonna do is balance the telescope, and this can be done during the day. We're gonna start with the RA, or right ascension axis. So, with the axis loose, we're gonna move this counterweight until the telescope stays where you put it. There we go. And again, this is the declination axis. To balance this, we make sure that the lock is loosened and we balance the declination axis by sliding the telescope up and down within the tube until it stays where we put it. When the telescope is balanced, we'll retighten these two nuts here, but we need to keep it loose enough so that you can still turn the telescope within the mount. 
then return the telescope to the home position and lock that axis. Now we're going to check the alignment between the finder and the telescope. This is the finder scope that came with the telescope. I recommend replacing this with a red dot finder. Red dot finders are much easier to use for finding targets in the sky, but we're going to work with what we've got. This is another task that's best done during the day. I usually use a distant chimney. Basically, you find the chimney in your telescope and use these three screws here to then center the chimney in the finder scope. Then you move back and forth between the eyepiece and the finder to make sure that the chimney is centered in both. If you're doing this at night, you would center the telescope on a bright star or a planet and then make sure that the planet or star is centered in the eyepiece and the finder. All right, now the most important part of using an equatorially mounted telescope, polar alignment. Let's start with making sure the telescope is on level ground. Don't set it up on the deck, that'll be too wobbly. I live in the Northern Hemisphere, so my goal right now is to point the right ascension axis directly at the North Celestial Pole. Now the North Star is pretty close to the North Celestial Pole, so my goal will be to simply point the telescope at the North Star while in the home position. The first thing we're going to do is set our latitude. Now if you don't know your latitude, just ask your phone. Hey Siri, what's the latitude of Halifax, Nova Scotia? Once you have your latitude, turn these knobs here until this dial matches your latitude. The second thing we need to do is make sure your telescope is pointed north. To get started, I often open the compass app on my phone and place it alongside the telescope, rotating the mount either left and right until the telescope is pointed north. Now, I can't actually see the North Star from my backyard because it's hiding behind a giant tree. So setting the latitude and pointing the scope north is generally good enough for me. But if you can see the North Star, it helps to do the following for more precision. You can find the North Star using the pointer stars in the Big Dipper like this. So what you're gonna have to do is try to get the North Star in your finder scope. Then you're gonna make fine adjustments to the altitude of your telescope and the azimuth, that's the left-right direction, until the North Star is centered in your finder scope. For even more precision, center the North Star in your eyepiece. This is also a good time to check the focus of your telescope before moving on to your first target. To set the focus, get a bright star and adjust the focusing knob here until the star is as small as you can make it. Now that the telescope is polar aligned, it's time to find our first target. The most important thing right now is that the mount itself should not move. If this for some reason gets moved, you'll have to start the polar align process over. And if you're new to telescopes, your first target should probably be the moon or a bright planet like Jupiter. Now, I always recommend starting with your lowest powered eyepiece. That's the one with the highest focal length listed on the side of the eyepiece. Only switch to a higher powered eyepiece after you're centered on your target and leave Barlow's off. A Barlow is the thing you stick between the eyepiece and the telescope to increase the magnification. You only use a Barlow when zooming in on the moon and planet. Searching for a target with the Barlow in place is extremely difficult, so leave it off most of the time. In fact, you might even put it away in a drawer. And when you're ready to move beyond the moon and planets, it helps to have a guidebook like 110 things to see with a telescope or 50 things to see with a telescope kids. These books are organized by season, so there's always something easy to see in your night sky. So assuming the moon is over here in the west, we're gonna loosen the right ascension and declination axis. We're gonna pivot the telescope over toward the moon. We're gonna rotate the telescope tube so that the eyepiece is in a comfortable position, and we're gonna center the moon in the finder scope. We'll then lock the declination and right ascension axis. Now we can use the right ascension and declination slow motion controls to center the moon in the eyepiece. With the moon centered in the eyepiece, you can begin to make your observations. Remember to turn the right ascension knob to keep the moon centered in the field of view. The right ascension knob can be moved from one side of the telescope to the other, whichever is more comfortable for you. If you enjoy observing the moon, be sure to pick up a copy of 50 Things to See on the Moon, which will help you identify and appreciate the lunar features like prominent craters and lunar seas. All right, let's wait until dark, go to a nearby park, and see how intuitive or non-intuitive, this mount really is. So what's I your name? Annette. Your name is Annette. Annette, okay. Can you use this telescope to find the moon? 
as soon as you're close, you're gonna lock okay. the axis like this and okay. this. Yep. You got it? Yep. All right, good job, <laughs> high five. <laughs> okay, so what's your name? Me. <laughs> <laughs> Me? Okay, the challenge is, can you use this telescope to find the moon? So, here's here's a here's a hint though. You might want to start with the finder scope. Find with this one first. Oh yeah. Wait. E almost. Almost. Okay. So what we're gonna I'm gonna give you another hint. Right there. Perfect. You got it. Okay. So we're gonna so. lock. We're gonna lock oh, these nice. axes here. Just twisting it, right? Yep. Mm. Ah. It's still there. You got it? Nope. <laughs> nope. All I right. think I was gonna... Oh, can you find it, Isaac? Oh, okay, wait, this is different. <laughs> <laughs> we had a little help from seven-year-old. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Isaac. This is what I found. <laughs> Yay, Woo! found it. Well, I hope you enjoy this video on using an equatorially mounted telescope. Please subscribe to Learn to Stargaze so you don't miss any future videos. And let me know in the comments if you have any of my books. I love the feedback. And remember, the future is looking up.